Okay, counting us in. Three, two, one. Joining us for the final time, everyone. Everyone's gonna have to hug and and say their goodbyes. Um, you know, before we all pack up our lockers for the season is, of course, John Urshel. Uh, joining us from the Great Wall of Starbucks, next to him, directly behind him, the Great the Great Wall of Starbucks. Once again, using the Wi-Fi there and. John, you're a champion. Regardless of what happens this NFL season, you are a champion of the world. Not many people have won these types of games against the world, which collective effort or whatever resources they use, but we won't talk about, they end up coming up with a lot of really good moves. And yours truly has lost more times than he'd like to count. So thanks for letting me, thanks for letting me bandwagon jump on you. Do you have anything you want to say to the people as we dive in? and look at this game from start to finish and how you beat the world. Uh, I guess I just want to say thank you to all the people who participated. It was a great learning experience for me. I mean, Danny taught me a lot. Bobby taught me a lot. And just having the time to think about each move really helped me grow as a chess player. And I hope that everyone got as much out of it as I did. Yeah, no, those are, I, I hope so too. I mean, I'm going to bet people didn't get as much out of it as you did. But, you know, but I bet they got a lot. Um, no, I mean, you're right. And it's honestly, it's one of the things that is uh, is really true, just to say real quick, about all these online chess streamers like myself, like, you know, Chess Network or Chess Explained or John Bartholomew. And John actually had a great video where he said recently, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And reminded everybody that if you're an aspiring chess player, you're not going to get a lot better if all you're doing is playing Blitz and Bullet, like pretty much all you see us do all the time, right? All we're doing is playing Blitz and Bullet videos, and those those are fast and entertaining, and and maybe sometimes you find an educational nugget or a random thing, but for the you know to really get better, you have to play chess that that you really dive into and think about every move on a on a on a deep level, and you know take the time to consider candidate moves and then assess you know, where your thinking went wrong and your plans. And so not everybody can play a vote chess game where they have one day per move, but any kind of game you can play where you really take the time to analyze it, just starting with, you know, play 30-minute games, 45-minute games, an hour game. I, I totally, totally agree with John that um, playing Blitz and Bullet, not to say it's not going to, like, we'll say this, it's better than video games are for your chess or <laughs> skydiving, like things that have nothing to do with chess. Okay, it's better than those things for your chess, Blitz and Bullet is. But unless you really have, like, the experience of pulling out w what happened in those games, which strong players can do, it really can be counterproductive. And, and, and so what you did, John, this is one of the best ways to get better is to play a serious chess game and bust your own ass to try to figure out the best move. I mean, that's how you get better, mm -hmm. you know? And so this is, um, I think this is an experience that, that um, will, will make you better in the long run. So we're going to dive in. Let's go ahead and start with uh, E4 here. Uh, John and I both played, uh, you know, we, we voted on E4. Uh, you can go ahead and make the moves if you want, John, with C5 for black. Uh, we have, are you able to make the moves there? Yeah, I, I made the moves. Oh, you played C5? What? Yeah. Huh. Technical difficulties? Technical difficulties. Oh, okay. Oh, Let me, now, now it should be working. Now you're a student. There we go. There we go. So now I got it. Now I got what you're doing. Okay. Awesome. All right, we're on the same page. So E4, C5. We had a Sicilian. We knew the world would play either E5 or C5, right? Yep. You told me they would play C5. Yeah, I guess that they would. They do most of the time. They played that against me in the most recent vote chess game. Mm -hmm. I think either E5 or C5 are statistically played at the highest levels more than anything else. So, so yeah, um, E4, C5, and, and now you you played the Alapin with C3. I did. So. I joked in the analysis to the blog that, you know, I tried to convince you not to play the Alapin, but really that's not what happened. I think you got to stick with what you know best. And in this kind of setting, I think the Alapin is really effective. You avoid some of the craziest, craziest lines of the open Sicilian, mm -hmm. and you get positions that are a very small edge you can push. So the world played D5. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, this is all theory, so let's just go for it. E takes D5. Queen takes d5, d4, take uh, knight f6. We all this stuff has been played many times. Uh, after d takes c5, queen takes c5. Though let it be known, I was really, really hoping for queen takes d1. 
Yes, and why I is was, that? Well, it leads to just very interesting games where actually sometimes I try to hold on to the pawn and try to use my four on two majority. Although my king isn't as safe, I'm less developed. It's uh, I've seen a lot of interesting games by some masters, and right. it looks like uh, looks like a fun line. So I always hope plus, for that, but I never get plus it. Plus, given that you're you're you know you're a Capablanca fanboy, right? You're an this is true. Lover. So you know, getting Capablanca, Smyslov, uh, right. Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. So now the world knows that about you. They're going to avoid queen trades next time. But uh, exactly. queen takes c5. Queen takes c5, and now bishop e3. Mm. All good stuff. The queen goes back to c7, knight to a3. So, you know, this is all typical stuff. I don't think we need to spend too much time on it. Yeah, go ahead with a6. a6 makes the most sense, you know, to stop knight to b5, and, and everything is, we're all on the same page. So this is this is a position that you and I had talked about mm -hmm. getting, right? Yes. In our, um, in our pregame meetings, and after knight f3 here, we had talked about the fact that bishop to g4 is, you know, it's um this line is is well known it's it's the principal thing for black to do when you play knight of three but it also opens the door for the variations that we got in the game so pre-game now we can tell everybody we spent a lot of time not pre-game but i think you know one of our earlier analysis sessions we spent time talking about the variations that we got in the game with this h3 move that was played and then mm -hmm. the bishop goes back to h5 and uh, now we have the principled position where white needs to go for this line with queen a4 check to really try to challenge black, and that's what you did. So all the analysis I wrote in, in the blog talks about how this is kind of a, a, critical, a critical line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can play more, you can play solid moves. Instead of queen a4, there's also, what is there? There's, there's also moves like where, you know, you can play for g4, um, you know, and then... And then try to uh, try to play bishop to g2 in some of these positions. This is actually fine. You can also play for knight to c4 in some lines. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think I think that queen to a4 is, is the line that makes the most sense. The point, everybody, is white's just trying to expose the queen side light squares. Right? Mm -hmm. um, this is all just pretty typical stuff. So now we get knight b to d7. And uh, we are right where we're meant to be. So, all right, so this, after bishop f4 and then queen to c8, this is this is a position that we had gotten in our analysis and we were ready to play. And then I, I, I talked about how, and we, we already did this before, we talked about how, um, so tell everybody, so was I right, I mean, we've talked about it, but you, you did, mm -hmm. obviously you spent some time on this, knowing that we had already looked at a numerous different things that white does here, like the knight coming into e5 and yeah. trying to grip the center squares. And of course, there's all kinds of tactics with black threatening b5 in some positions. And, right. um, you know, so I was right to say that I think you went with g4 based on the fact that, you you know, it seemed like the most principled thing to do based on what the database said as far as, you know, the lines and, and the mm -hmm. success of the line on a percentage level. Um, yeah, people, people were straight killing it with g4. Right. So, I mean... And, and so yeah. the database there, like, says, like, you know, white scores really well with this line, but then... You know, so one of the things we talked about, which I write, wrote in the analysis, and it's good for everyone to know, is, you know, whenever there's less than at least 20, but even less than 30 games, you always have to be really careful about a, a, a lopsided percentage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is because, like, basically they played the line like 10, 15 times, and then all of a sudden they abandoned it because they realized it's just like losing, right? I mean, sometimes it is because the line is just terrible for one side, and so you get a 75, 80% score because that's, that's a very high percentage score. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's it can be, you know, really misleading because maybe there's a couple games that you just throw out because somebody was an idiot and just blundered. Then there's a couple more games you throw out where white won because maybe they were just like four or five hundred points higher rated. So they were probably going to win no matter what they did. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you start looking at the line and analyzing it. And you realize, OK, maybe this isn't like. Maybe this isn't as good as you would, you know, maybe were first led to believe. So, and I think that that's the case with G4. I think that it actually allows black to complicate uh, things more than we want. Um, and, uh, and so that's what happened in the game. But let's talk about the line that we, we think, you know, should have been played here. So I'll, I'll go for it. So we talk about this move 95 here mm -hmm. instead of G4. And, you know, one of the biggest differences is that if the move B5 is played, 
now black can now white can play the move queen to d4, and mm -hmm. uh, and that changes everything because black doesn't have the ability to strike in the center and change things. The bishop on h5 sort of feels a little empty, right? A little purposeless over here without any any pin. Also, um, can't uh, can't knight take b5? Oh no no no! It, never mind. In some positions that we've seen that happen, right? Seen but that, not but in I, this line, yeah. No. Um, it's one of the reasons, for example, if we back up, since since we talk about it, if we back up, it's one of the reasons, for example, like, you know, black can't play b5 here, for example, right. you know, in, in any positions before because the rook is undefended. And there were some variations we looked at in the database, right, where, where right. white would sacrifice it straight up like a sacrifice, a knight for two pawns. Yeah. But I don't know that those were that clear, right? It was like, it was sort of an unclear way for white to play if white wanted. Didn't mean it was a winning line for white. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so 95 is the main thing is that it's principled to stop black from striking in the center. That's the main thing about this position. Mm -hmm. And, um, and okay, like the computer even still gives the position as pretty unclear after queen to b7, especially initially. But one of the lines I wanted to display for everybody, because I spent a bunch of time analyzing it, is that there is sort of a horizon effect here based on white's potential to get a really monster initiative. And it starts with the move g4. Uh, this is just Boomtown, right? We're going to give up the Rook on H1. This is awesome stuff. And we're going to castle long. White is currently down a Rook, right, if you're keeping track, which is awesome. I mean, how often do you get to be down a Rook and, and, and still be in the game? So, uh, and not only in the game here, but if you continue to go for this line, the position, you can already see those who are watching the engine above us here in the video, John, can see that the engine flips the script on the position pretty quickly. Huh. And now white is up. I mean, okay, like, you know white is winning when material-wise you're down a rook and the evaluation is nearly plus 1.5. So that's like a that's like a six and a half point swing in a position where you're down a rook. So one of the main line. I think there's several right, ways for you, white to win uh, this line. What, you, what? Take the, you take the knight? Yeah, the key you, here now is you take the knight. And then take on b5, right? Right. Um, and then uh, you take on b5 and you get this just, this is just super sexy, right? I mean, this is awesome. You're mating them with threats on 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 knight to c7 check. If they if they take on b5, we didn't even look at that. I looked at this. What if they if they just take on b5? I think I think if they take on b5 instead, um, I think we're just okay. We might be winning if we just like take on d7 and then play bishop takes b5, getting d7. If they play rook d8, you can uh, that may be winning. But it looks like the computer gives an even better line which is this move queen to b6, d launching a discover attack on the queen uh, and with all kinds of threats like bishop takes b5 and mate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, now now the computer just gives lines where black should just be giving up the queen. Mm. So that's that's the huh. that's the variation that, that brings us home. Um, so pretty cool stuff just to see that yeah. this position Tricky is stuff, potentially... Very cool stuff. What? Tricky stuff, but very cool stuff. Totally, totally tricky stuff. And, um, you know, it's if we're looking at this position after queen to b7, again, because the evaluation is... is now, now, it is a little trickier than that, because after g4, there's also this move knight takes e5 instead of queen takes h1. But the point is, like, I, I think... Um, I think we, uh, if we were going to really have this line prepared, we should prepare it, and that is always good advice before you go in for a variation where you're giving up a rook. Uh, we weren't using an engine, obviously, during the match, so we didn't know exactly what would happen in a line like this, and you were doing most of the work, honestly. You were doing the heavy lifting. I yes. was just I Straight was up, smiling and nodding. There is no way I could have like seen that line coming. No, of course not, right? Yeah, and, that is, and, that's not really... It might be a human line for some humans, but not right. this human. So. Not this human. No, dude. It totally. And uh, but it is now that now that you know, it's one of those things that makes you really good over time, though. Because who knows? You may be playing in a tournament, right? You're an ambitious right. player. You're trying to become a master player, and yes. you're you're probably going to play this line again. Mm -hmm. And and at some point, you know, there's two things you can draw from it. One, even if you don't have um, everything worked out. When you've seen certain types of tactics occur in a position, like I've seen G4 occur where I've lost a rook because I had that session with Danny, or I've seen I've seen 95 be important before G4. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is over the board, you know, you allow allows yourself to have you know to go down that road a little bit, and maybe you you know because the key is when do tactical patterns become 
something you can apply in more positions than just this one specific line. Okay, if you get this position on move 13 against somebody, you might bust their ass, right? Which would be awesome, right? You win a game because of preparation. I've had, you know, games like that, but you'd be surprised that for someone who's played as much chess as I have, like, I mean, I've probably won like four or five, like on a single hand, I can count a game that was won before it, before like my opponent knew it even started, you know, because mm -hmm. they just went into something that I had worked out for whatever reason, right? And, mm -hmm. and, okay, at the highest level, it happens more often than single hand, but even at that level, I mean, they would tell you that a lot of times you do a lot of work and those ideas become something you apply in similar structures, in similar development schemes, in similar openings because you've seen a tactical, a tactic idea, be, you know, you get familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Very rarely are you just busting somebody because you had a, it completely worked out. Right. So, so that's going to help your chess anyway. And I think mm -hmm. that one thing we can draw from this is that, okay, in this line, you know, this line that, you know, going back to this position here before, you know, when we played G4, was that, you know, that one G4 immediately is a little bit, is a, is a little bit of a mess because of this idea of B5 and E5 like they had in the game, basically. Mm -hmm. So now we know the importance of kind of putting the clamps on that, whether we get the whole, the whole, you know, the whole Monty, you know, whether we get mm -hmm. everything, then great, right? But if not, then it's still something we learned about the position. Right. Um, okay, so we go with G4, and the truth is, so now that we're back to the game with G4, um, once b5 was played, we have uh, we have a problem. The, the queen had to go back to d1 because of the tactics on e5. And um, just to just to show everybody real quick, we'll just say that the whole point is that if the queen had gone to d4, black has this move e5, and we confirmed it with the engine. The real problem, okay, and maybe there's other moves, but the real problem is regardless of how you take here, there are tactical problems coming with the move bishop to c5. And um, followed by castles and and Bob's your uncle, it becomes a becomes a total mess for for White. So, so now what we wanted, you played the move Queen to D one, and uh, and that was awesome. Okay, so we continue. Right, Bishop to G six. Mm -hmm. We have Bishop to G two. Yep, finally the Enchero in. Right, E six. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about one of the common themes that you'll find from my analysis, those who want to go read the blog, and I'll have a link to it here, is that, um, you know, it doesn't mean that E6 is a bad move here. It, it could have been the move I'm going to suggest could have been played several times, but certainly an idea that wasn't played for that should have been was this idea of putting the bishop on E4 in some positions. Um, and, and the key is that the battery here just really causes white some headaches. And um, in some variations, it could be it could be a real mess because White has you know overextended the king side, and if those pieces disappear, there's some problems. So e6 was totally fine, and that's what we're going to go with in the game e6. And and uh, you played the move bishop d6. Although, so you saw you saw my whole the whole thing I said right about knight to c2 right that 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 whole line with knight to d5 and knight takes c3 that we were scared of wasn't the end. Of yeah, the game. yeah, we looked at it, and I don't recall. Why? But I recall we looked through like a ton of lines with it, and we really decided that it was not looking good for us. But right, you know, sometimes well, I, the engine comes back and you know proves you wrong. Yeah, exactly. And in this case, like I think we made the best decision we could have. Uh, it was the decision we were both kind of comfortable with. Bishop to d6. It, looking at the position, it makes sense to me to play bishop d6. And mm. the point, everybody, is that knight c2 runs into this sort of really, really scary and irritating move. Um, which is a double attack on the bishop and the pawn here because of the threat of knight takes c3 check. But for those of you who want to check out the analysis in the blog, you can see that there's some long lines here where the engine says maybe white's okay. And, and um, you know, so I guess good to know, right? But not something that we're really going to beat ourselves over the head with because I think that I think knight d5 is a legitimate concern and the tactics on c3 look really scary. So, so we played the move bishop to d6. Yeah. No, I was happy with bishop to d6. Yeah. And and what we learned was that really bishop takes d6 that the, that the computer that the humans played was was not the reason bishop to d6 wasn't great. The the move that that they could have played uh which which they didn't was basically just to ignore the bishop and play the move queen to b7. Which again is is coming back to this idea of of threatening to put the battery clamp on white's king side. So one of the lines that we gave was queen to b7. If bishop takes f8, then we have knight takes f8, 
and after something like knight h4 to try to get you know get prepared for bishop to e4 coming because it's really irritating if it happens yeah. black just plays bishop to e4 anyway and this is this is kind of rough for white i mean look at the position what do you do here mm -hmm. um i mean the move that we analyzed or i analyzed with the engine was that you, white can castle and black can take on g2 and and you take with the knight but let's just look at that position right i mean if castles bishop takes knight takes and they just play like some natural moves you know um castles bishop takes knight takes natural move this doesn't look very fun for white yeah. black is much more coordinated that King side is yeah. weak that knight on a3 is not looking too hot right, right. now it doesn't feel good agreed yeah um so I, I don't I mean usually when you have that many voters they come up with the best line. So I think that if I was to say like the real thing that was most surprising to me was that after bishop to d6. So we get mm -hmm. to this position with the bishop on d6. You know, the next 3 to 5 moves by the world leading up to this move queen takes d4 where they really helped you to just after that dude. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like you were just like you got out of the way and like Capablanca was just coming through man and you just <laughs> Like, I mean, we're, once we get to there, it's like we're just going to be, you know, we're just going to be tooting your horn. But I think that the way the world handled the next three to five moves here was critical with two things. Like, one, their their lack of appreciation for how potentially irritating it would have been for White to get this battery here. I mean, mm -hmm. Bishop E4 is logical. Mm -hmm. Queen to B7 is a logical move. I don't think those are, like, super hard moves to find. Yeah. Um. So, and, and Bishop, and, and if you look at... Some of the games, this position already, I think we're 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 already in novel territory. This, you know, John Urschel versus the world. This is this is this has never been played. This position, at least in, according to my database, but the idea of bishop e4, John, has been seen in a lot of these g4 lines. Like it's something that Black does when White plays g4, and Black mm -hmm. has to relocate. So I think I think that was really like the real criticism there that the, that they just didn't find the accurate approach to how you def how you expanded on the king side and. And so it's cool. Not very often do you get to like play a, a mistake like G four and kind of learn the lesson and still and learn the lesson the right way without having mm -hmm. to lose. So I, mean, I don't yeah. know. I'm just I just I feel like you just you know you just had it going. It's like you had full mojo. Oh yeah, dude! As soon as they took on D six, I was laughing. Yeah, you were just much happier, right? So happy. Yeah. So they so let's go for that. So let's go with what they did. They took on D six, and uh, you you took back. Right, they played queen to c5, which is a move I also criticize slightly. Not because black isn't black is still doing okay. Like to be clear, you know, according to the engine, and I agree. Like despite the fact that I agree that bishop takes d6 was was not the best one. We've already analyzed queen to b7, bishop b4, the battery idea. That was the real meal ticket for black to punish you for 12 g4. But 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 I was but even though black is okay here, it just felt like they were headed on the wrong path. And and you and you played a really good move here. You backed up queen to d4. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I was not taking that queen. Right, that would have been and terrible for me. Not only because, not only is it is it terrible for you to do that because um, because it's you know like giving into what they want, but it also just helps bring this knight to exactly where its goal is to undermine these queenside pawns here. So yeah, so very good. Queen to d4 was right. You uh, they castle. I castled. You castle. And now uh. Now they played rook a to d8, yeah. which is also fine. So again, mm -hmm. everything up till here to rook a to d1 yep. is, despite the fact that it was a, definitely a little bit misplayed by the world, could have had a bigger advantage with the with the light square diagonal grip. Mm -hmm. This is still okay for black if black, you know, basically for the last time could still play bishop e4 here. I think, or, or is that? Um. Yeah, I think I, I think. I think that Black could have still played Bishop E4 here, and the move just keeping the queens on the board. That's the one that the engine liked best. Mm -hmm. Just keep the queens on the board, and as I said in the analysis, because why trade? I mean, mm -hmm. if anybody has a king that's potentially weaker, it's Whites. So if we're evaluating, mm -hmm. do you want queens on the board? Usually, that's a that's an indicator. If you're uh, looking for general tips, when do I know to trade queens or not? Well, whose king is weaker? Okay, mm -hmm. if I think my opponent's king is weaker, that's usually uh, at least a guideline. If you're fifty fifty on the fence, that's something that should suggest, you know, keep the queens on the board. Mm -hmm. White still has not solved the problem of this knight. 
right? So White has not solved the problem of this night. And one of the things that could really be said about the game, John, is that the way they played, not only did you never have to solve the problem using my Dr. Evil quotation fingers, <laughs> the night ended up being right where it needed to be because you were able to win the A6 pawn and mm -hmm. undermine the B5 pawn, right? So True. That, was a, that was a game changer when when you were able to to basically justify the knight on a3 rather than mm. have to you know rectify the knight mm. on a3 that was so that's a big thing about how the position was misplayed mm. um but again also if we're just looking at this at this position there's no reason to trade here even if you don't play queen to c7 B bishop b4 as i said is still a possibility um and and queen to c7 for the record threatens the move knight to c5 with a discovery on the yeah. queen and then bringing the knight to a4 now the mm. main line i analyzed was um was if queen to c7, white can play the move queen to d6, and you're kind of okay. I mean, you're. I mean, so you're you're going to be slightly worse here, but you're not much worse. They go queen mm -hmm. to c8. Um, you bring the other knight into d4, which looks really cute. You're headed into c6. Knight to c5 is forced. Queen to c6, and so you know, kind of a complicated line that I get into. People can check out the analysis. Let's just say black is still going to be a little bit better. Black has a better version of the end game that you got versus mm -hmm. them. Um, but I think on a, from a, just a general perspective, it would have made sense any which way they decided to not trade on d4 would have made more sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we get now we get to the big show where you just like I, I don't even know. I mean, I feel like did you are you sure you didn't grow up in Russia? I mean, your your <laughs> rush your technique, dude. You were like. You were just like a giddy little Russian schoolboy. I'm telling you, as soon as I got the queens off the board and I've got my rook on that D file. I just knew like the D file was mine. Yeah, and 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 it, what you're saying like we're we're saying it like humans, but the engine agrees. I mean, those watching this video can see like before we were looking at lines that were anywhere from like minus 0.4, minus 0.6 if black was doing well, it definitely a slight edge. And now look mm -hmm. at the evaluation. If anything, so now it's back to totally equal as we let Komodo sit. And this is the the best and newest version of Komodo for those wondering, Komodo 10.1. Most people don't even have it yet. Mm. Um I got me the hookups, you know, one of, one of the only advantages um, to having uh, these these regular Komodo matches we have on our site with uh, Larry Kaufman and company, and they do an awesome job. So we'll give the lizard the lizard team some credit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the engine agrees with you. And, look, as we let it sit here, John, the evaluation is getting bigger and bigger for you. So your feelings are backed up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so nice, isn't it, to have your feelings validated? Oh, yeah. Dude, I mean, like, if only I could get my feelings validated in my marriage. I mean, I feel like things would just go so much better. Dude, you know, don't you know? worry, I will validate your feelings. <laughs> You're validating. Me. I'm validating your feelings right now. So, yeah, I mean, this feels great. And and uh, rook takes d4. Um, I did analyze for the record that knight takes d4 was possible too, and I think you still get a little bit of an edge. But rook takes okay. d4 is the most accurate. So mm -hmm. you did the best. And well, it was, we go. The, it was the easiest. Yeah. Knight to C5, turn. you just you bring the other rook in. Yep, double down. Double down. I love it. Right? Always double down yep. on 11. Always double down on 11. <laughs> and that's what you did. Rook takes, oh. rook takes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here we go. Knight to D3, and then you get rook to D6. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're – so tell everybody – let's let you talk a little bit. So tell everybody yeah. – because I think this will be helpful. I think most of the players or voters in the game are somewhere within a couple hundred points of your level, either mm -hmm. or either plus or minus. You know, so you guys are all, you know, aspiring tournament players. And so, what did you calculate here that made you know you needed to go for the race of who could get rid of the queen side faster? Well, the biggest thing I was looking at was the procedure that that's a lot easier for me to take when we get closer to these endgame type structures is for me to just look and say, okay, what are my candidate moves? Right. And I take note of all of them. Okay. And then... And what, what were those? Oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. My candidate moves here were rook d6. Another candidate move was b3. Another candidate move was... Let's see. b3. I know I had at least one more candidate move. And yeah, I think, was, I think we talked about, maybe we talked about knight h4, you told me later, yes, was candidate move? Yes, knight h4 okay. was the other candidate. Okay. And so how did you go through your process of elimination there, like eliminating the other ones? So the way I eliminated the other ones was I just started calculating through the variations. Okay. 
and trying to see how these things looked for me. Oh, okay. and the last one I calculated, I calculated B4 as well. B4, okay. Yeah. So B3 turned out to not be very good after I calculated Knight C1, and then I'm not actually getting to their black pieces in time, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty much thoroughly incapable of protecting that pawn, and ideas like rook goes to d2 mm -hmm. are not actually the best here. And uh, you calculated a pretty awesome line here. Remind everybody what that was. What did I... If, hold on. No, no, no. Let me... Uh, I'm going to let you figure it out, but after rook to d2... I know well, I calculated e something. It was... Right. Was it... Oops. Oh, did I calculate? Let's look at knight e4. Mm -hmm. knight, Indeed. Yeah, knight e4. And now that rook. Yeah, it's a real problem. It's and trouble. Remember the key, and you showed C me the key line was that, was that on rook to c2, you just play knight take c3 anyway. Right. And black is just winning because of this awesome fork on E2, regardless of which knight. Right. Yeah, 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 of course. Right. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, in, during the game, John, I can tell everybody, like, you, you, you calculated that key line, which I think it's a key line, I mean, really on both B3 and B4, mm -hmm. right? Um, B4 might be worse for other reasons, too. Maybe the C-pawn's backward, but black's got his own back rank issues. So I, yeah, think, I think knight true. to C1 is the most clear thing. So, How yeah, did you B eliminate knight H4? As, so, a, as a main idea. Knight h4, I recall, I think it did not look good against, uh, let me see. I think against just knight c1 and that a2 pawn is falling. And I don't actually have any way to really make the knight pay for taking on a2. Like, I can't really trap it. Right. And I think... um. I think in the end, you know, if, if we if we're thinking like general pieces of end game knowledge we have, right? So one of the things about this position is you have a three on two, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever we have a pawn majority, what's our goal with that majority? Try to reduce it, get a passer. Right, reducing get a passer. So normally when you think of that, you think of plans like you know you make trades, like you turn yeah. a pretending pass pawn into mm -hmm. a real boy. Right, you turn Pinocchio into a real boy by just making the obvious moves. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the other way to, to, you know, to basically simplify the majority is to do what just, you did. Just, just like, start taking things. Right, just old west shootout. Right, you're mm -hmm. going to take a bunch of pawns. They're going to take a bunch of pawns, and in the end, somebody's going to end up with a passer. And so, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so it was good stuff. And I just wanted to hear. Yeah, I wanted to hear what you said. I think that. One of the things to remember for everybody at home, too, is sometimes the way you find the best move isn't by, like, calculating that one move is brilliant. It's by doing what John did, basically process of elimination, by sort of mm -hmm. eliminating all the other moves as options, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's, that's a very important thing to remember also when you're, um, when you're like, attacking the king. Sometimes you start, you start calculating all the options, and, you, and, and if you have the wrong mindset going in, which is, let me find the line that leads to checkmate. Mm -hmm. Instead, don't look for that, because maybe none of them do. Instead, what you right. do is you start eliminating the lines that clearly don't improve your attack. Mm -hmm. And in the end, if you find only a couple moves really, like, help, you mm -hmm. know, now, now you're able to, to more accurately choose one of your candidate moves. Yeah, um, the, the biggest thing I did was, you know, I looked, I picked my candidate moves, I calculated through and I tried to imagine in my head which resulting position I liked the best. And I wasn't always trying to find like the best move, the most accurate. The biggest right. thing I was concerned about was just always making, making bad move. good moves. Just right, yeah, make a good a move. Good Don't move. play a bad move. Don't play a bad move. Make a good move and make sure that you like that I liked my position more than when I started. Man, I mean, it's like, are you a poet? I mean, seriously, bro. I mean... <laughs> All right, so here we go. Rook to d6. Yeah, so then knight takes, rook takes. They have this right. bishop d3 idea. Rook a5. These are all the best moves according to the engine, just FYI for people mm -hmm. at home. 
I like it. All until now. Until the world's move night to C4. So, the last, I don't want to say last chance, and I, and, I mm-hmm. said, and, I, and I said that, you know, to be clear, I think things are getting tough for Black anyway. But let's back up one move and kind of highlight that um, I think the miss, I, I'm going to guess mm-hmm. that the, they were already committed to this line where they gobble up A2. Whatever resources they were using, whatever they went mm-hmm. into, I can already say that if anybody was breaking the rules and using weaker engines, usually they have open source engines, which are not as strong as engines like the Komodo engines because mm-hmm. those are paid for engines. I'm just, this is like, I'm just swinging from the hip right now. So I'm going to go into like, you know, Sherlock Holmes mode and be like, why do you think they went for this line, Danny? Here's what I think. Mm-hmm. I think some of the voters might have been doing doing um, bad things and using a weak engine. And what happens with weaker engines is they suggest lines that end up going for material. Mm-hmm. And there's a horizon effect. There's a drop-off where, like, the stronger engine has the depth to see that grabbing a pawn loses, like, several moves later, right? Mm-hmm. And and so it's it's a very common, we'll call it, um, you know, it's a trap. It's like a, it, we'll call it the weak engine trap. Now, mm-hmm. everything I'm saying right now to those who are, I'm not accusing anybody of cheating. I don't know any of you. But I will let you know that using any sort of live engine resource while a game is going is against the rules and is what we would call cheating. And I'm going to suggest, because I did my own detective work and used Stockfish, which mm-hmm. the one that's open source, and Stockfish initially does suggest these lines where you go for the A2 pawn. Just fun fact. So am Get I right? Know. Am I wrong? Who don't know? You know, but I think it's a theory, right? It's a theory. Uh, theory. And I think, um, you know, so it's, it's dangerous for black anyway, but I think that that might have had something to do with it. Who knows? Yeah. The, the move that I looked at with Komodo is this move H5 as a move that hmm. basically if you recognize that you're worse in the end game, you know, giving yourself the chance for active defense is a very important thing to remember. Where basically think of this, you'd rather be down a pawn mm-hmm. but stop dealing with these issues of a back rank where your rook is basically a bystander because always you get mm-hmm. checkmated and you know the the king side pawns are not anything you can attack because they're protected. So what you do is you want to go for counterplay to increase your chances to hold the end game usually that's the best way to go. It's the Dvoretsky thoughts, mm-hmm. you know, of school, the Dvoretsky school of chess, which is you'd rather have an, a rook ending down a pawn where your rook is active behind a pawn than you would an equal rook ending where your rook and king are bystanders to their rook and king dominating. So, and, and almost always it holds true that active defense is better than passive. So here's the line I suggested to the world instead of it. H5, mm-hmm. 95. H takes G4, H takes G4. I mean, so already we've created Mm -hmm. a potential pawn target, okay? Now the move rook to B8 uh, to try to hold the pawn, which you're not going to be able to do. White plays G5, black brings the knight to D5. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking, if I'm black here, to just go like guns a-blazing and try to create some chances that I can get everybody off the board. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what black is trying to do here. So now the line for white, the best line goes knight takes D3. And then go gobble up the pawn. But you'll remember uh, one thing I suggested as like a potential issue for... for um, so there's two moves here for black. There's there's this knight coming into f4, which mm-hmm. tries to get some counterplay. But the other move that may be underrated, even though it's going to say that, that, um, the bla- that, you know, that white's better, is the other knight coming to f4. Because one of the things we said that can equalize a bishop versus a knight is if you have a centrally uh, positioned knight, right? If you yeah, have a true. knight in the center of the board that you can hold, because usually mm-hmm. it's blocking a diagonal. And so let me just, okay, I know white's better here, all right? Mm-hmm. But I just want to point out that it could take some technique because right now it's a little irritating. And with the knights well positioned, it's possible that if this rook ever got an open file, that might be really annoying to deal with while you're trying to get a queen. Right. So white would have to be careful here. That's all. You would have to find mm-hmm. a way to advance the pawns while keeping, you know, the two knights and rook at bay from getting counterplay against the king. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll, we'll just leave it there. Yes, Komodo says the position is about a pawn better for white, but mm-hmm. that's saying something when white is up a clear pawn. So you're only up a pawn, and it's not like there's anything else great about white's position. There's some potential risk here for white. This would have say, yeah. we'll just say this would have taken some technique. To yeah, Danny, this looks like a tough position to me. I mean, I know I'm better here, but... This looks much tougher than what happened in the game. Right. Um, okay, so there you go. So that right. so that's the that's yeah. the I mean, that was a little bit of help from the engine, a little bit of just Back like what the, would I do if I 
if I was using this saying just as a human, how do you how do you try to hold end games where you're worse? Well, you got to create opportunities for active defense and create counterplay. That's just mm -hmm. something you should always be looking to do. Don't let your opponent grind you in, while you're keeping the material even. Mm -hmm. Give up the pawn and get your pieces on their most active positions, and you will always be increasing your practical drawing chances. Yeah. So actually, this uh, this rook a five move. Yeah. This is one of the moves that actually took a decent amount of thought for me. It's a this phenomenal a move. move. Okay, so let's talk about. It. I want you to tell everybody why you played it. Then. Yeah, let's, I mean, um, let's well, talk about it. So, the moves I was looking at here, I was actually looking at like a slew of things from rook a five to rook b six to uh, knight takes b five. Ah, uh -huh, that's right. We talked about that with the score and, idea. Yeah, actually. At the end, you know, when I was calculating all these things, I really wasn't sure between rook a5 or knight takes b5. Mm -hmm. I thought rook b6 was just kind of a poor version of rook a5. Mm -hmm. I thought rook a5 just gave me better things positionally. Mm -hmm. But uh, this knight takes b5 idea was something that I flirted with for a while. Okay. But I thought the two moves were roughly equal. And I was a little less certain about this move, so given that I, you know, had the advantage, I went for, you know, what felt more comfortable, given that they were about equal. I thought. Okay, I'm looking at this line here because we you talked yeah, about this being, this being the key, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in the end we ended up, I ended up, I, I think rook a five is actually better than equal, and I think the key that we ended up figuring out is in this line, um. Black actually gets something close to what we just had with the H5 line, um, and maybe even better because now, now when you end up when you end up winning back the pawn, mm -hmm. they have this they have this key idea where in the end they they always get to sort of sink one of their knights on D5, right? And I think one of the biggest reasons why Black never Black didn't hold this ending is because the approach you took never allowed optimal coordination. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this position and, and think about, okay, you're up a pawn, and yes, the bishop sounds really nice in terms of helping this square, right? Mm -hmm. It just, like, feel like if we're just saying superficially, it's like, well, how can this not be winning? But, I mean, how are you dealing with, like, the rook coming to the B file and this knight mm -hmm. coming into F4? I mean, this is, you know, yeah. and, and, and for the record, the engine agrees with what you did in the game. I think it has rook A5. Yeah. Like, this position is much more unclear than the mm -hmm. one that you're getting with rook A5. And I think, um, I think rook A5 is better because it's the more patient approach from the perspective mm -hmm. like basically uh now black has to prove how how he's going to make sure he gets a pawn to go with the pawn that you're definitely going to win mm -hmm. the other line is more like it's like what we talk about the karpov school of chess right like but then i like you don't want to just trade off taking their weakness and giving them one of yours like you want to really make them you know be mm -hmm. begging for an opportunity to get something that's equal value mm -hmm. um so this was a great move. Rook a5 was a great move. It really was. I appreciate right. that. Okay, back so, to the game. So rook a5, uh, and, and here they go. They went for knight to c4, and I, I, I gave my theory already, so I won't repeat it on why I think knight c4 was played. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that h5 is, like, holding for black, but I think it's, I mean, clearly in the game, and, you know, what, what, what we're going to see, the engine's evaluation, it definitely had much better chances. And from a human perspective, again, if you're worse, counterplay and activity, that's what you want, you know, and um, and knight to c4 made your life simple. You took on c4. Yeah, natural move. Didn't take much time on that. They got to take with the bishop. Um, now the Komodo says, Komodo knows that you can't go for this line, by the way, of taking the pawn. So Komodo mm -hmm. says, you know, black should be taking with the pawn. But it also says that white's winning. Yeah. I mean, because you just have a, you have a very strong a pawn mm -hmm. here. I mean, look at the difference. Like after this, you 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 put this knight yeah. on on a, I don't know this I mean, either square mm -hmm. looks phenomenal. No 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 ideal blockading of the diagonal is going to happen, mm -hmm. right? You you've stopped that. You're about to just rush the a pawn till kingdom come. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is not good for black. No. Um. Oh. So they took with the bishop. Mm -hmm. And uh, you played ninety five. Yep. Yeah. And this was the key line. Somebody mm -hmm. set off their car alarm. Bishop Somebody did. <laughs> That's all right. Mm -hmm. Bishop to d5, and this was the key. 
is okay. that you you're able to go for this line mm-hmm. that again I've already yeah. said the the early you know weaker open source versions of Stockfish initially suggest this is the best and that Black can take this pawn and that that's why you but then but then if you actually put Stockfish here mm-hmm. see if you actually put the Stockfish in this position here before Knight to C4 was committed yeah. with the Bishop on D5 Stockfish is strong enough of course to know that this is bad mm-hmm. so once this position occurred. You know, and I, and I remember there were some voters for Team World who were screaming like, "No, don't go for Bishop takes a two! Like it, you know, it loses the piece." But at this point, if you don't play Bishop takes a two, you're 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 busted anyway. I mean, now they've lost the pawn because they committed to this line with Knight to c four. Mm-hmm. Um, I did analyze, and again, people can check out the blog Rook a eight as sort of the last last chance. At least Rook a eight, you know, has some ideas of okay. At least it doesn't blunder the piece. Right. Say that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, they can't so, take the pawn, but yeah. Right. They can't take the pawn, and so the move is c4 still, mm. takes and takes, and um, you know you get these positions where oops. Yeah. What's good for them now? Something like what? Just like h6, h5. Yeah, h6, h6 or g6 to free the yeah, back g6. rank. I, I think I analyzed g6. Yeah. And okay, so like you know, whites up a pawn and a half. So already this isn't as good as our h5 suggestion earlier. Not going for knight mm-hmm. c4, right? But still, yeah. I think it's fair to say this holds better drawing chances than what they did in the game. Um, you know, they they're putting a tough question to you. Maybe you make the wrong one here as the aggressor. You probably shouldn't go rook b2 and try to hold both pawns. You mm-hmm. should look to just convert on this pawn and let yes. them equalize material, but but get some awesome counterplay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Komodo gives lines that involve like you giving up the pawn, but like checking and then going here, and then all of a sudden this pawn falls for black. You know, so uh, it's it, I think it's winning for white, but still mm-hmm. this would have been some technique you know required more than more than you had to show in mm-hmm. the game. Although I I feel pretty comfortable with that position. Yeah, I, I agree. I th- and I and and I think you would have won it yeah. totally. Um, but they didn't. They played Bishop takes a two, and then I mean, so how? Tell everybody just how excited you were when they played Bishop takes a two. I was overjoyed. I was in disbelief. Right. I like. I could not. I mean, it's. I mean, they have been playing, you know, such strong moves. Right. And then when I got that move, I was, you know, All right. I was a little excited. I, you did the uh, you did the uh, the big guy scores a touchdown dance. Right? Oh, I, I mean, did. <laughs> As soon as they made that move, I decided I was going to win this game. I know when we started, when we talked about doing this vote chess thing, right? We started talking, and I was, you know, I was talking to you, I was talking to Bobby, and I was saying I was going to draw this game, right? And that was going to be like the win. Yeah, draw. No, we. I I said that in the comments I made to the blog, right? I mean, a draw was going to. Like it's not to say like we didn't you know think it was possible, but you know I didn't think it was possible. I was I, I, like I right. I mean hoping to get a draw. Yeah, like but I'm not then, a chess uh, master. I'm not. You know what I mean? Right. But dude, you you know you analyzed. I think I think the uh, the the work ethic showed. I mean, more important than you know whatever else you know people might evaluate as far as ratings on paper. But you analyzed every position for hours, and yep, that's that's. Uh, that's what ended up making it, and and now you you did exactly the key point. C four yep. traps the bishop. C four, and uh, and White's winning. Yeah. Uh, now it, there was one cool thing and one last of instructive point. I think you saw this in the analysis I sent you, but I want to show that it's probably the last instructive point like I can give you as your coach. So I want to do it, and it is it is it is that here in this moment, right after knight h seven, rook to b two, mm-hmm. and they took the pawn right. Mm-hmm. So we analyzed. I analyzed this position and the move that you played. Of course, is winning, uh, and it and 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 after that, I think I think you you did exactly what you were supposed to do. But it is a really common trap psychologically mm-hmm. to make. So I want to highlight it. So when you when you outplay somebody mm-hmm. and you achieve a position that you know is winning, mm-hmm. it's it's very very easy to just commit to the line that you calculated ahead of time, right? And to not mm-hmm. continue to take each position as like a fresh, a fresh opportunity to see: Am I playing this the most accurate way? Am I converting mm-hmm. in the best way possible? Um, and so, the move you play, knight takes c4, seems like a complete no-brainer, right? Yeah. But there's actually this super, super strong intermezzo. Right. It was right? g6, right? With g6, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the point, everybody, is that this move causes black just. A million problems, right? Mm. If they, 
in the game, you end up losing the g-pawn for the bishop in the same way. But it's a difference of this structure, right, right, where there's so many weaknesses, clearly something that would be much easier to barrel down and pick off versus mm -hmm. a completely healthy pawn structure and two pawns for the piece, which is, you know, there's there's potential to go wrong there, right? And right, then it, of course. It, um, and so... It's just a good lesson for everybody that when you when you're winning to always especially if you have the time in blitz it's different because you're you're executing based many times on your intuition and based on probably what you've already kind of assessed you mm -hmm. don't have the time to retake on every single move but in, in settings where you do it's just it's a good muscle to build it's um you know to just consider all your options once again and if they you know if they save the bishop anywhere you know the the difference between this position and the other one is also significant because Okay, uh, there's a lot of lines to look at, but basically you're going to achieve a lot. You're going to achieve optimal like presence and pressure on the king side faster than you're able to in the game, mm -hmm. and and so that was just a really cool, um, a cool little intermezzo that I didn't consider either. Yeah. You know, it's just it's it's obviously something the engine finds instantly because they don't have any human preconceived biases right. of oh I already committed to this line of course I just gobble up the bishop right. Mm -hmm. They always consider every position fresh because they're jerks. But that's what makes them so good, and and, and so it is something that hu engines can teach humans, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's cool. Anyway, yeah. so there you yeah, go. I, I didn't even think about that move. Like, right, knight takes and, and c4 so, was automatic. Right, so you took on c4, mm -hmm. um, and they you know they took on g5, and that puts us in this position where you know you, you play the right move. I still think rook to b5 and f6, and and but it, you know especially because of the inability to go gobble up the h pawn. It, you know, there's going to be some work to be done because it's a much healthier structure than it could have been. Mm. Um, and then, and I, you know, so I almost got into some trouble here because I was thinking about taking that H pawn. Right. There was some serious thought about that. Right. Well, I think it was it was because you had already kind of calculated it earlier, right? You had yeah. calculated that once you win the the bishop and yeah. they gobble the pawn, you had already said, okay, I know, I know, I can go do this. And, yeah, I and calculated then, but, that like five moves ago. Right, and, and that's another really good example of the same kind of psychology I'm talking about. Another place to go wrong is just following through blindly with something we calculated earlier. You didn't do that, yeah. right? We talked about it. You took the time to assess, okay, actually, that that would be that would not be a good thing. But um, it's another place where we can go wrong and, and lose advantages is by committing to something. And it's just funny because, like, human beings use words like that, committing, you know, and like, you know, the psychology of it, like engines, like what's commitment to an engine, right? I mean, right. They, they, you know, they've never made a, they've never had a healthy relationship in their life, right? I mean, so there's no, there's no faithful commitment there. And no. um, just the way that we think about chess and, and, and uh, develop our plans is about, we talk about following through with a plan and, mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, we've committed to some a line and it's just, there aren't a lot of like, Engines can tell you the right answer, like the right answer in the back of a math book. But there aren't a lot of like opportunities where engines really give you something instructional that you can apply universally. But I think mm -hmm. that that is one of them. You know, one, there are two things that I've learned from playing and, and analyzing positions with engines. One is this psycho psychological thing of having the discipline to reassess positions more often than I do and seeing mm -hmm. more resources than you would. Because, by the way, I mean... We use these words as humans in psychological pretenses like commitment. It's not, we don't have to. Like, you don't have to follow through with a line just because you calculated it five mm -hmm. moves ago. True. I mean, right? Yeah. And the other thing they teach you is high-level prophylaxis because they're always just so ruthlessly punishing any tactical mistake. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to, like, if someone, if you find yourself not converting on advantages because you're missing a, your opponent's opportunities, the best mm -hmm. way to get better is to be a masochist and play the engine and let them just destroy your face over and over again. And they will force you to learn to respect your opponent's threats. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, anyway, so there you go. So you didn't do it. You played the right move. You played rook b six. You're just, you're just. All, I mean, it's like you know. Do, do you want to thank the academy at this point? It's like I don't know who you want to thank. Um, you know, here this is awesome. Bishop h three. Yeah. We analyze this. Everyone can check out our early, our video in this position. Obviously, mm -hmm. everyone knew how I felt about it once you got f four. Yeah. To me, as I said, like the engine. The engine actually says f5 is the best defensive move mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of box at the idea of knight to d8. Mm -hmm. But um, from my human perspective, the moment they played f5, as your coach, I was yeah. breathing easy. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, yeah, you get it. I was like, there's no way you're you're not going to win this now. Like, this yeah. is just. Yeah. You we, just, you can... The dark squares are ours. Mm-hmm. 
So the engine calculates 98 accurately, and people can see the analysis. But their 98 is losing faster, you know. But from my human perspective, it was like I would try to justify this to try to keep my structure together, knowing that was my best chance to draw. Because the moment mm -hmm. I play f5 and they lock me down, it's like, well, I might as well just, you know, it's just sit there and bend over and wait for them to just beat you up, you know. I mean, that that's what's going to happen, and, and I don't want to do that. So. <laughs> Uh, anyway, but you you did the right thing. You, you had you had perfect technique here. Loved it. Ninety five knight g four. The engine loves your move knight f three. I was criticizing you for not trading. You know now who's laughing? You are. King f seven knight g five check. Loved it. Loved it. Then you traded. And as I said in the analysis, and now you get to laugh at me. You were actually right. The engine, the engine loves your idea of relocating the bishop to get e six more than it does trading. Yeah. Now from. Okay, like to defend me and Bobby Hess's perspective, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, we recommended this because, you know, simplification mm -hmm. when I know I'm winning just makes right. life easier. And I just mm -hmm. didn't want to even think about counterplay. Um, and it is winning. But, mm -hmm. you know. In also, some ways, I, think, like, I think Hess would rather us not lump him in to that decision. I recall Hess being down with both. Okay, yeah, you know, Hess so was the all the Hess was in the middle. I was the one really pushing for this. But you know, um, it actually, I mean, for human, from like a human perspective, that's definitely the move. In that, you saw further depth with that move than I did. Whereas I thought, you know, I've got an advantage. Don't reduce too much too quickly. Right, I, and I've got this e6 pawn. It's backward. I can try to relocate my bishop, try to win this pawn, and mm -hmm. try to activate my king to protect my two pawns, mm -hmm. and away I go. So I felt very uncertain about taking. Honestly, like, I, I learned something from this moment, too, and I think that it's where I've messed up games sometimes. So I'll put myself on the, you know, on the hot seat and say that I actually, you know, and the engine agrees still. I'm letting the engine sink in just so everyone can see. Komodo is saying bishop to g2. It has been. And and I think that, okay, so here's what I calculated. So I have, like, you have general rules for yourself as a strong player, right? It, I, I gave you advice on simplification. Just because you're winning, it doesn't always mean trades are better, right? We, I talked about right. how, you know, this can be a bad psychological pretense to have. It's something coaches sometimes, I think, overdrive into their kids. Like, as soon as you're winning, trade pieces, trade pieces, trade pieces. And, and that's not always good because blind trades can sometimes water down your advantage you don't notice it at first but mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like you get to a position like wow where did my advantage go or at least where did my clear wing go so you have to be okay. careful but but i but i think about simplification like this if i'm sure that it, that there's no like immediate like consequences so once i calculated that they couldn't take this way and get king of five because of right. this tactic Mm -hmm. and, and so once I saw that this wasn't going to be possible, like it was like I blacked out from there and just decided blindly. I was like I was being dogmatic in my thinking. There's no way I'm not taking G4 because once I'm sure that it doesn't improve their ability to, to activate their king because mm -hmm. of tactical consequences, I'm like, how am I not going to go for this? Like this is, gonna, right. this is a winning endgame. I've, mm -hmm. I've gotten rid of some counterplay. I've pushed them back. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, of course, this is winning, and, and, and it's correct, right? Mm -hmm. But – but that also can be a dangerous bias because as I got into some of these lines, like this protected pass pawn became really irritating. And as we saw, <laughs> like there were some positions that, you know, were a little tricky to win, right? Yeah, and true. and if I was in a real game under time pressure, who knows what could happen? And so, I think I've been a little bit too quick to simplify once I know. Okay, there's no immediate tactical consequences. Mm -hmm. I see a position I know is winning. Am mm -hmm. I really am I really taking my own advice and trying to be objective and play like an inch and see every position as it is new mm -hmm. and be like, all right, well, do I really need to be impatient here? Can he really right. stop Bishop D five? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, and you're no. kind of right, you know. And so, well, in well, also just to give myself a little less credit, I was thinking about Bishop F one, not Bishop G two, just to. No, but it's also I mean, it's, it's also it's the same it's idea, a similar idea, yeah, similar idea, but just uh. Right. Yeah. Well, part of the reason why bishop g2 is better, just FYI, is because it holds the d5 square immediately. Um, and I'll show you the line. So, like, so like yeah. if bishop f1 and they go here, which if you remember, that was something I said I was worried about, right? right. Like, because mm -hmm. if they get this move, now they're forking your pawns. Right. So, and by the way, you can't go bishop c4 now. 
Right, of course. So yeah. that that was like a legitimate reason we were like, uh, like what to do now, right? right. Um, but bishop to g2 doesn't allow that because if they go here, you just gain a tempo and then kick this pony right back, right back where it belongs. Like the computer gives some line that goes like this and they still basically just can't do anything and, and you go back right. to d5 next. But we, uh, we looked at that same line but we just looked at the bishop on b5. I don't know. Right, I don't understand why that's different. I think it's different because, let's see, because if bishop f1 here and bishop to b5, the difference is that once the rook moves, uh -huh. that you still haven't stopped knight to d5. So in this position, you can just go king f2. Like, okay. Right. In, 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 right in this position, you can go king f2 and there's no knight d5. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. But, in this, but in this position, right, exactly, mm -hmm. you can't. Just oh, just okay. come up blindly. Yeah. So yeah, you're still winning, but this again right. would have been like, all right, mm -hmm. now what to do? Um, right. So okay, so it's good stuff. It's a good final lesson for everybody, right? You know, be objective. But you you went for bishop takes g4, yeah. taking taking my advice, and you know we've learned that it maybe wasn't the best advice, but it has its it has its human merit. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, I think it, it's important to not be. Oops, it did. They didn't play king f7. They played king e7. Um, it's important for me not to be dogmatic in my thinking either. You know, like, oh, I'm, I've, I've, I've seen that there's no tactical consequences. They can't play king f5, and I'm just going right. for it. And it was like, at that point, I became blind. Right. Right? And you don't want to ever be blind to, like, the potential areas where you're wrong. Like, and um, anyway, so good lesson. Here I suggested king of 2 Again, probably wasn't the best, you know, well, but, but... I mean, you, you it's a good idea to activate your king. I don't know why. I mean, I know why. I was really for rook b7 right. because just instinctively as an end game player, when your opponent's king is stuck on the back rank, Makes that's sense. just like that's just like music to my ears. Right. And, just and by instinctually, the way, I agreed with you. Yeah. But uh, but I mean, king f2, as the engine showed, was also very good. So I think it was just a matter of taste. I don't. I don't know. I think I was. I think I was a little bit too quick to say. King, of, well, also there was that there was this awesome line which I think I gave you in the analysis. Remember, I was worried about you had said King of Two and Knight to G Five, and and by the way, the Komodo agrees with you. But what I was worried about, if you remember, was what if they go all out for some yeah. kind of crazy E Five? Right, and, and we I, can't and take I was, that. We gotta go F Five, and now right, we, yeah. And then I thought I thought F Five, and maybe they get E Four. But of course, what I missed was. One, this main tactical idea here, which the engine is now showing, is just F6. And it's just so sexy because now you're mating me, and if and if they have to take, Knight H7 comes in, and you're winning the Rook. Oh, shit. We did... So this, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right, dude. This is YouTube. We did, you we can actually say whatever did, you want. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't look at that. that. No, no but, but that was what... So to oh. our credit, we didn't see this line, but that's also like... That's like a really engine-y line to just drive mm -hmm. the F-pawn up the board. Yeah, I didn't. You know, see or, or or like super GM level line. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. So that was kind of like a little bit, you know, fair for us to be like, well, or, or I'll say this: I didn't see that line. I'll just make it, you know, personal. My fault. I didn't see that I didn't idea. See that line either. Right. I just knew that the king on the back rank, bringing my knight to G five and pushing that pawn to F five. I just right. knew I felt good about that. No, I totally looked at the and position and I thought this is something I can win. Right. But, you, you remember know. what my thinking was. I, I agreed with that, but I, but I, one, I didn't see that line. And because I saw e5, I was like, you know what? Why do you have to do anything? He's not threatening e5 now. Just play sure. king f2 and like let him sit yeah. there. And you can always play this move next. So that yeah. was my thinking. But again, I think I was wrong on a concrete level. No, but and, I think um, it was uh, I mean, it was a good move. And it's not an issue of being right or wrong. I mean, when you're in endgame play, it's only right or wrong when there's only one decisive move to make and you know right. in a lot of end game positional plays games like this i feel like there's many different strategies and as long as you take a winning strategy you can't say one is necessarily better than the other you know absolutely again that's like man are you a are you a chess commentator you know they're very no. yeah i agree no i think i think it's a good point yeah. and it's actually where a lot of people not just to dismiss i mean a lot of people go wrong in end games by like freaking out and always feeling like there's only one road, like it's not right. always, like you said, like unless you're about to make a decisive mistake, mm -hmm. the truth is, you know, you should play for positions that are sort of we'll call them like goal oriented. Thinking from mm -hmm. the end is very common, where you're sort of using that. Okay, if I get the knight here and the king here, I know I'm winning. If I get the mm -hmm. rook here and the king here, I know I'm winning. It's not always an exact 
concrete science, right? Right. Um, yeah. And so, and, and what's funny is also we do get credit because we'll get to this position where the rooks are traded, even though this is theoretically like a point and a half less than rook b7, just for the engine lovers at home who are watching this. Yeah. Like, this is like as soon as we make a couple more moves, in fact, look, the engine's already jumping. Like, watch the concrete evaluation, yeah. you know, start yeah. to go up. Well, you actually, know? really, when I knew I had won this position, like, yeah. for certain, for certain, was when I played this move, when they went rook d8. I saw this idea of rook b7. I could still push the king to the back rank. And I knew they had this choice of rook d7. Mm -hmm. And when I played rook b7, I had calculated rook d7. And as soon as they played that, I knew I had a forced win. And you, and you knew you were, it's just, I just, I, yeah, I as soon knew. as they, as soon as they went rook d7, that's when like, yeah. I knew. And I, it's like it's like everyone talks about when they knew why they love their wife. I know why I love you right now. Okay, because this the way moment right about here was <laughs> this moment. moment. I when did I, I know I love John Urschel? Right here, as he just talked about this endgame, as he has the brick wall of Starbucks behind him. Also, this is like my dream position. Just like right, grinding my way to a win via an endgame. Just via this is like this is how I want to win chess games. No, I know. This is like it's like yeah. if every if every game could just start with the queens off the board, you'd be exactly you'd be, you'd be a happy kitten. Yeah. There we go. So you got the king to e five, and they play g six, and uh, and G6. now you and I mean calculated this was, perfectly. Yeah, it was an issue of timing. I wanted to make sure that when I brought my knight to g five, uh -huh. their king was on f seven. Right. So this was something that was crucial that I calculated. And as soon as their king is on f7, when I bring my knight to g5, right. my knight gets back. My knight can take their pawn. And get back. And get back to protect that g-pawn in time. So that was the crucial thing. You know what? I've never, I've never, heard, I've never heard anything I, I agreed with or loved more. So thank you for just speaking. Like, you're putting candy in my ear right now with everything you're saying. I love it. There you go, and now and then you then you now, really put on put on the uh, put on your best dance and shoes when you play the move f five. Bring this, and then I win that. And even if they don't take, if they do other things, actually in this position in general, I'm very well off because I have waiting moves. Right. If they don't. Right. Yep. She takes. King takes. And now this is this is. Do they resign here? And that, my friends, is how the West was won. Exactly. It is where they resigned. It's where John Urschel went down in history. I think you're the first non-titled amateur yeah. chess player to win a vote chess game versus the world. I like People it. People are going to talk about like Like, who was the first person to win like a, a vote chess game versus the world without a title on chess.com? And 10 years from now, when we rule the world, they'll be like, wasn't that John Urschel? Hmm. Right? But and 10 years from now, they'll be like, wasn't that John Urschel? But also... Wasn't that back when John Urschel didn't have a title? Right, exactly. They'd be like, this is no, what no, I'm how can you say John Urschel? He's a grandmaster now. No, dude, back then he was just 1600, and you believe that Danny Wrench was still better than him? What? Uh, Danny Wrench will always be better than me. But, <laughs> no, you know, no um, but if you have a GM title, they'll be like, man, Danny was better than him back then. They'll be like, man, how long ago was that? NM title. This is what I'm mm -hmm. fighting for right now. Anyway, but seriously, uh, very, you know, and your description of how you approach the end game, disciplined positions where you have waiting moves, position where you know you're the one playing for two results, where they can't get counterplay. Mm -hmm. And the way you talked about, you know, simplifying, I mean, I think hard work pays off. Sir, you did it. I couldn't be more proud. <laughs> and, uh, and all right, man, people are going to ask, when did Danny know? I knew. I knew John Urschel was my prize student. I knew I fell in love that moment. That that Starbucks, that overcast sky. It was a it was a cloudy day, you know. Uh but anyway, man, congratulations. You did great. This was a lot of fun. Thanks to the whole world for being involved with it. Absolutely. And uh we will we will do this again sometime or find some other way to mix it up. I think the next thing is you need to get somebody else, like an athlete friend of yours. We need to have like a, a battle royale where like I get to be your coach and then they mm -hmm. get a coach. So title mm -hmm. player on title player coaching, mm -hmm. amateur on amateur battling. Let's set that up soon. I love I'm that. I'm ready for that. Uh, let's, we got it. So what is it? we're just going to find a partner and it's on, man. Yeah. 
All right, everybody, thank you for watching. Give us a like, give us a share, give John, give John a thumbs up, and uh, we'll, we'll see John on TV this season, mm -hmm. NFL, and, uh, and I'll go back to just doing videos without, without you. <laughs> oh, man. We'll, we'll do another video again. We'll so. do another one. We got to do something. All right. Bye, everybody.